um, because I'm a giant nerd, I want to talk about the Flash now a little bit. Sure, please. Uh, without gushing too much, oh, yep. we, we were talking about uh, on our on our blog about favorite single issues of any comic ever. Yeah. And I believe I said that my favorite single issue of a comic is, um, I believe it's Flash number 93 where Flash uses Johnny Quick's formula. Yeah, 91. Uh, 91, thank yeah. you, thank you. Uh, to, to, and, and it freezes the world and yeah. Max Mercury comes. Um, I don't know if I have a question. It's it, it's it's a great character piece. Thank you. It's a great character piece into uh, Basically, when Wally was changing, this right. is this is when Wally. Um, so I guess the question is, when you started writing the Flash, did you have a, 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 an outline from the very beginning? I want to take Wally from where he is now, yeah. which was still kind of a, a self-absorbed guy, right. and and obviously he wasn't as fast as he was. Yeah. To you wanted to make him uh, into the hero that you knew he could be. Right. Uh, so. What, so you had a plan from the beginning? I, I would like to, not really, I didn't know, because I didn't, in my first regular assignment of any of any import whatsoever, I didn't know how long I'd be on the book. I, uh, the book was not doing well in sales just because the TV show had been over for a little while. Yeah. And, the, and and so the, the expectation at DC was, well, then the book will eventually just die out. So there was that sort of, that gave me the freedom, the, the safety net to be able to do kind of whatever I felt like doing. Um, I didn't really have a plan so much as I just had an idea that Wally, in my mind, had a chance to be the first of the, the, the first sidekick ever to step into the shoes of his mentor fully and, and totally. Now, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, in in the last few years, we've seen it since with Bucky and with and with Dick Grayson being Batman and so forth. But you know, at that time, it was a radical concept: the idea that the sidekick would eventually become the hero. And yes, he'd been Flash for 60 or so issues by the time I got there, but he was still. He was still Kid Flash, really. He was still he was Flash. he yeah, was still yeah. insecure. Exactly. He was and he wasn't the hero. That he, he he always lived under the shadow of feeling like he was never going to be the hero his uncle Barry was. Yeah. And after getting in there and getting working with the character and and getting a sense of who he was, uh, I realized that's something we needed to do with him. Was we needed to graduate him. We needed to really to give him that that story with the return of Barry Allen. Sure. Sure. That, that made him realize at the end of that story, all right, I am my own man. I have matured. I have grown into the role. Yeah, that's great. That, Thank and, you. and so then what do you, uh, you know, personally, and, and maybe you have to be uh, diplomatic, how do you feel about the return of Barry Allen? Not, not, not the comic that you wrote. Right. That was great. The, but the, the, the actual re rebirth. return, rebirth of, of Barry, like in the universe. Um, I, it, I honestly, I mean, I, I think that it's a, it's a good story, and I think that Jeff will do great with it. I'm, I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed, just because I, I, I so am invested in Wally West as a character that it, that it makes him very superfluous, and I'm, and I'm glad that they didn't kill him off. I'm glad, I'm glad for that. So. I am glad for that, and, and I guess that's where I was getting because yeah. I, I've. Not that the Silver Age Flash stories are bad, but I've never, I've never connected. Even even going back and reading them now, like right. you know, with with some of the the uh, all the trades and everything, I've never really connected with him. I've, he's never seemed like a really really good fleshed out character to me, as opposed to where uh, to Wally. Maybe it's just because I grew up with Wally. Well, I think that I think that Jeff will do a, amazing work in that Certainly, arena. I'm so, not yeah, I, I, that. No, I, I agree. But I, um, but yeah, it just it's. I, uh, I just sort of have to. Uh, there are there are stages and ages in comics history where you just kind of there are points where you just kind of step back and go, all right, that I you know a new generation of artists and writers has come along or a new you know a, a new movement is happening in publishing or whatever. And you just have to step back and go, okay, that's not what I would have done, but sure. it's you know as long as people are reading, as long as people are excited about the character, um, I, I mean I think they were I think they were kind of in a bind too because they. There was the feeling that there wasn't much left to do with Wally, which I'm not. I'm not sure it's true, but I didn't do anything to help the cause. I mean, I, I think that you know, after Infinite Crisis, and they decided to keep Wally around. That's great. They gave the book back to me for a little while and said, well, "What would you do?" I said, "Well, I, I don't want to do exactly the same thing I did before. No. I would rather do something completely new." And in retrospect, that was a mistake because clearly, the, what the audience and I'm not even saying this out of any. Disappointment. I think it's. I think it's my, I, I take fall from misreading the audience. Oh, okay. I think the audience wanted. If they wanted me to do Flash again, they wanted me to do exactly the same kind of book I was doing before. But my problem was he already had two. He had two kids. He had a wife. He had a. He had a life. He had, it wasn't the guy I left off. You know. No. No. Not at all. And so. 
I rolled the dice creatively, and I took the chance of doing something which I thought was rad really radically different. It wasn't first-person narration. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just about Wally. It was also about the kids. I really sure. rolled the dice creatively, and uh, by all yardsticks, apparently crapped out. So, really? well, I'm. I like what we did. I, I did too. Thank you. But, but I, 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 we were clearly in the minority. So, well, and, and so, I guess, and I don't, I don't know how much time you have. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I, getting into the writing of that, yeah. is writing uh, comics uh, for you? How much of a balance is it between between doing your own thing? And and trying to read the audience, and I mean, you don't want to give the audience exactly what they want. Sometimes. You never, you never give the audience what they want. No, you always you, you give the audience. Well, yeah, then you'd have all splash pages and 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 big uh, big fights everywhere. And you well, don't want yeah, that. I mean, you, you give the audience. The, the, the thing is, if if the audience knew what it wanted, it wouldn't be an audience. True. It would. It it, it knows what it it kind of knows what I, you have to you have to be able to read the audience and know what it is that's going to get them excited, what they don't expect. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, honestly, when it comes down to it, and it's just me and the keyboard, I can't think about that too much because that's paralyzing. If you think about every guy on every message board and every potential customer and every potential retailer and everybody, if you try to if you try to listen to every voice like that, it'll just freeze you in your tracks and you'll never get anything written. Really? So you just have to, at the end of the day, put your head down and go, okay, this is my vision of it, this is how I see it, and if it works, it works, and if it doesn't work, then at least I tried my best. Gotcha, gotcha. That's, that's great. I could actually probably talk to you for another few hours well, about all the, other, all, the, all the other stuff, yeah. but um, I want to talk about a little, one more thing. Sure. Um, I want to talk about your run on Fantastic Four and specifically uh, working with uh, Mike Waringo yeah. and and uh, that yeah. the the heartbreaking issue where uh, where the FF meets Jack Kirby. Yeah, thank you. Where where did that where did that come from? I I shouldn't say where did that come from. Yeah. Um, is that something that you'd wanted to do for a while? Like you, you know, you thought it'd be great to, for the FF to, to meet their creators. Not necessarily. No, it, actually, it was the opposite. It was that I just knew, all I knew was I wanted to pitch a story in where the FF go to heaven because they're the ultimate explorers in the Marvel universe, and that's yeah. the one place they've never been. It's the one place nobody's ever gone in the Marvel universe, and 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 lived to tell the tale. Or, sure. You know, or, or actually had an adventure there, and it and, and so that idea came first. And it was only after I get into the the nuts and bolts of the story with Mike that we realize, okay, well, it's kind of a cheat at some point if they don't meet if they don't meet God. Well, what is God in the Marvel universe? And the answer would have to be God as an artist. God's God's uh, you know God as a creator. And yeah, totally. And so I think it was Tom Pyre, actually, writer Tom Pyre, who's my pal, who also helped crystallize this idea with me. Uh, but I, it made it perfectly clear at that point that it would have to be Jack. That's, and, that's perfect. Yeah. And, you know, we managed to work, uh, you know, not into Stan there as well, so it's not just Jack. I mean, Stan's on the phone with his collaborator at some point. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was fitting. And that that I, and, was great. And I'm, I'm very happy with the way that turned out. It, it, it's, it, it, it's one of the few comics that, that can get, can you, that really kind of touches me, Thank like you. When, when you see it.